So hello and welcome to this uh, complimentary webinar in the Sartorius Stadium Data Analytics uh, series of complimentary webinars. Today we're fortunate to have a guest presenter, Dr. Sanla Kjellqvist. She's going to give a presentation with the title Multivariate Data Analysis in Translational Chemistry. And I am that I'm talking in the beginning. My name is Lennart Eriksson and I will be the organizer and moderator for this webinar. Uh, going back to Sanela, she took her PhD in biochemistry at Uppsala University in Sweden in 2008. Thereafter, she did her postdoc at the Karolinska Institute, working with analysis of omics data in the cardiovascular disease area. Sanela holds a position as senior expert in multivariate data analysis at Science for Life Laboratory in Stockholm in Sweden. And she has over 15 years of experience using different multivariate data analysis tools in her research and clinical practice. So Sanela, please uh, tell us your story, please. The word is yours. Thank you, Lennart. And thank you very much for inviting me to give you this uh, talk. Uh, I will start by letting you all know that in the front page of my presentation there is my email address. So if you would have any questions later on, you are welcome to contact me uh, on that one. Uh, all the um, uh, results that I will show you in this presentation are published in the two publications that you can see references to in the front page. One of them uh, in 2016 in the Journal of American Heart Association and the other one in 2013 in molecular and cellular proteomics. So if you want to, if you're interested and curious and want to read more, you're welcome to read those uh, publications. So I will start by telling you a little bit about the institute where I work, and it's called Science for Life Laboratory, and we are a national uh, institute that is um, uh, functioning as national service to uh, Swedish researcher all around our country uh, and we also are a local scientific center so it's basically an institute that has started recently and we also have uh, both um, uh, different service facilities and scientific research groups who work in close collaborations with us. So my role in the institute uh, is that I belong to National Bioinformatics Infrastructure Sweden and I collaborate with many different groups around Sweden and Swedish universities helping uh, different groups out to analyze their, their data basically. So outline of my talk today is that I will talk about uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm uh, and diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. Uh, I will talk to you about omics data in the context of transcriptomics, proteomics and lipidomics. And then I will go into multivariate data analysis and give you a short background about the multivariate data analysis tools that we have been using in this, these particular studies. Uh, I will then give you some results about the aortic aneurysm study and also about myocardial infarction diabetes study. In the end, I will uh, summarize the results from here. So starting with the background, uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm is uh, what we call asymptomatic disease, meaning that the symptoms are not um, visible, you cannot really feel that you have pain or something like that, and it's a quite dangerous disease because it has to do with widening of the thoracic aorta, and basically if the thoracic aorta has uh, uh, wide, been widened too much, it will burst, and which is of course a lethal condition. So there are some monogenic forms of this disease, and I will not talk about the dose, but rather about the neurism that is associated with bicuspid aortic valve uh, and tricuspid aortic valve. Um, and the aim of the study is that we want to identify differentially expressed proteins between dilated and non-dilated aortas in persons who have a tricuspid valve and those who have a bicuspid. Tricuspid uh, is more of a normal state, so to say, and some people have a bicuspid aortic valve as well. And we know that since earlier that those people who have bicuspid, who have only two cusps in their valve, they are more prone to 
uh, get the rotation in the aorta. Uh, however, even persons who, individuals who have tri who cuspids, who have tricusps in their valve, they also get widening. And the um, uh, hypothesis from the beginning of this study was that persons who have tricuspid and bicuspid valve have different mechanisms of dilatation. So we wanted to find out if that was true, basically, and see how uh, uh, differential expression of genes, uh, differential expression of proteins, and alternative splicing looks like among uh, these different patients. An outline of this study was that in collaboration with thoracic uh, uh, surgeons at Karolinska Hospital, we were able to collect biopsies from both non-dilated and dilated aorta during valve replacement surgery and, and reconstruction of the dilated aorta respectively. So, uh, meaning that dilated aorta uh, tissues we were able to collect when the uh, dilated aorta was uh, surgically removed basically and replaced uh, by a surgeon and non-dilated aorta uh, we were able to get really small small pieces from during valve replacement surgery so uh, we should then remember that our controls who are then non-dilated they are healthy in their aorta but they have some kind of of course problem in their valve because um, that's the surgery that they were undergoing uh, we were able to connect to collect an 81 patients for our RNA analysis for differential gene expression and for proteomic analysis we included 44 patients and 44 patients were then run by 2D gel electrophoresis followed by multi tof analysis and 21 of those patients were also run by LCMS MS proteomic analysis so another study where I was also part of uh, was diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. And in this case, we were interested in lipidomic analysis. So both diabetes and cardiovascular diseases are associated with dyslipidemia that is known. And diabetes is characterized by high total triacylglyceride levels and low high density lipoprotein cholesterol. And CVD, on the other hand, is also associated with high elevated low density lipoprotein and low HDL cholesterol levels. There is strong emerging evidence of, of tag levels in CVD, and DM is one of the major risk factors for CVD that we know. And aim of this study was to understand why uh, diabetes is a strong risk factor for CVD. They maybe have shared etiological disturbances. Uh, we know that total plasma tags as well as LDL and HDL cholesterol are used in clinical assessments for decades. However, total plasma measurements of tags, LDLs and HDLs only is a sum of different lipid classes present in circulation. So aim of this study was to coverage down to molecular lipid species with identification of molecular fatty acids and using MS shotgun lipidomics. And for this study, uh, we choose to use 16 clinical parameters as a Y matrix in diabetes, including fasting glucose, two-hour glucose, BMI, and waist to hip ratio. And 27 clinical parameters as a Y matrix in myocardial infarction, including IMT mean, so intima media thickness mean, uh, IMT max, plaque area, plaque score, heart rate, BMI, waist to hip ratio. So the diabetes and myocardial infarction study is really integrative omic study where X matrix is um, lipidomic data and Y matrix is clinical um, parameter data. While Aortic aneurysm study is a discriminative analysis study where we are looking at uh, 
persons who have dilated aorta and those who don't. So looking at different kinds of omics data now, because I have chosen to include several studies in this presentation basically to show you how multivariate data analysis can be used in different kinds of omics data um, that exist today. So I will start by uh, looking at the first uh, aortic aneurysm study that I uh, just told you about. And when I started as a postdoc at Karolinska Institute back in 2009, what we had was a matrix exon array data, basically. RNA-seq was uh, very expensive at that time, and it also needed a lot of uh, sample that we really didn't have, especially for non-dilated aortas. So uh, the, the group that I started working with, they choose a Fimatrix exon array for many different reasons. Uh, and one of them was basically the cost. So today, uh, a lot of people are using RNA sequencing, and that is basically uh, also a very good option for the reason that you can see uh, and identify novel isoforms and looking quite deeply into alternative splicing. Of course, depending on how deep you would then choose to sequence. Uh, so we just mentioned that these methods that I will talk to you about today are also, of course, uh, can be used for uh, RNA sequencing data as well, and that's something that I am using frequently on an everyday basis, I would say, uh, as of today. So, uh, going back to Affirmatrix exon arrays, uh, they basically allow you to look at different exons and their expression levels, and thereby also study alternative, alternative splicing. And I will also mention something that is really important when it comes to multivariate data analysis that is maybe not the most fun step to do, but uh, extremely pro important, and that is pre-processing of data. Uh, and not only of, a, of, of metric exon arrays, but also of RNA-seq data, of proteomic data, and so on, and metabolomic data. Uh, in order to really understand your data from the beginning, it's really important to understand how to normalize the data and how to filter the data so that you don't include basically genes or proteins that are not expressed that will blur your analysis later on. So in this case, we have used something that's called, for example, splice index calculation uh, because we were thinking that we don't only want to study differential exon expression, but also alternative splicing. So if we would look at this figure here, we would see that if we would have differential expression of a gene, all the exons that are, for example, controls, the black in this case, or dilated that are red, uh, would have the same kind of differential expression all over the entire gene. Uh, we would rather want to look at something that has to do with alternative splicing, and that would be the case if one gene, for example, all of a sudden one exon had uh, um, higher differential expression of one exon in that gene, or several, uh, but not over the entire gene. So for that reason, it's really important to normalize over the gene level so that we were able to study uh, alternative splicing. So here are just some examples of different alternative splicing events that can occur. One would be canonical exon skipping, 5' prime or 3' prime alternative splicing, 5' prime or 3' prime usage of alternative exons, intron retention, and so on. Uh, for the aortic aneurysm study, we were using two different kinds of proteomic analysis. So proteomics is uh, quite tricky to work with uh, because we cannot basically say that we studied the entire proteome uh, because of the dynamic range of proteins, basically. So depending on really what you want to study, you would choose different kinds of techniques to use. And we have chosen two different techniques, and one of them was 2D differential gel electrophoresis that has been um, 
stained with uh, something that's called dyge, so it's a flor fluorophore, and we could then um, separate the proteins based on their isoelectric point and molecular weight. And basically, each dot that you can see on the gel in this um, in this slide would be a protein. And then the proteins were identified by Malditoff MS, and we also val validated results using Western blot of interesting proteins. We also used um, another study. In the same study, we used LCMS MS proteomics, and for this particular study, there are two different. Well, there are several different kinds of uh, LCMS MS proteomics, but one of them would be the shotgun LCMS MS proteomics, where you basically, uh, in the previous slide, we would separate the proteins first in the gel and then identify each and every every spot. However, in the LCMS MS proteomics, what you do is that you add trypsin uh, to your sample that will digest proteins into peptides, and then you would uh, run that sample on an LC column and uh, shoot into the MS MS instrument and identify the proteins. And usually you can label the uh, peptides beforehand and that thereby you can also find uh, you can get your data to be quantitative. Uh, we used however something that's called integration of IPG EAF in shotgun proteomics meaning that before you uh, separate your peptides on uh, uh, LC, LC column you would uh, load the peptide mixture on isoelectric focusing strip and you would cut that strip into different pieces and load those different fractions uh, after one another on LCMS MS instrument in order to get deeper coverage of the proteins. So what you do thereafter is to basically identify the peptides and then you uh, add those peptides to different databases and search for what proteins they belong to and thereby you can then find out what proteins you have in your uh, in your samples. So uh, this is just to show you basically the workflow. In, in our case we had our samples were as I told you before they were different um, pieces of aorta and we digested and um, uh, proteins from there uh, and we run isoelectric focusing on the peptides. Thereafter we run LC MSMS MS, uh, on those and uh, did some biological interpretation, a multivariate analysis of course on, on the data, biological interpretation and some validation. Similar approach was done in, done in shotgun lipidomic data for the myocardial infarction and uh, diabetes study. Uh, HPLC uh, liquid separation was used for the lipids and mass spec analysis was used as well. So giving you some short background of different uh, omics data uh, sets that we were using, I will talk to you about multivariate data analysis methods that were applied to those uh, data sets. Uh, multivariate, in multivariate data analysis, usually what most people uh, get acquainted with for the, for when they start doing multivariate data analysis is principal component analysis. And principal component analysis is unsupervised multivariate data analysis that will basically um, show you different trends and groupings in your data. So in this uh, slide, I'm showing you a three-dimensional uh, plot where you X1, X2, and X3 would, for example, be different genes or proteins. So protein 1, protein 2, protein 3. And the blue dots would then be individuals that have 
different expression levels with those three different proteins. And of course, we can now see three dimensions with our own eyes and see different trends and groupings in our data. But if we imagine uh, that we have 2,000 proteins or even 300 proteins or 20,000 genes, then we cannot imagine 20,000 dimensions, of course. It would be too much. So what we basically do with principal component analysis is to project down these in this case that I'm showing you here, three dimensions down to two. But that can also be done, of course, with more dimensions. So this is basically being done using um, uh, the first principal component according to the least squares method, and the second principal component according to the least squares method, also perpendicular to the first one. Uh, other methods that we can use in the multivariate data analysis uh, are called partial least squares, orthogonal partial least squares, orthogonal partial least squares, discriminant analysis, cluster analysis, canonical correlation analysis, and so on. So these are just some examples of what can be used. And in this presentation, I will show you principal component analysis, orthogonal partial least squares discriminant analysis, and orthogonal partial least squares analysis. And if we now see the difference between partial uh, orthogonal partial least squares and principal component analysis is that as i told you principal component analysis is unsupervised method where uh, on your x matrix that can be proteomic data lipidomic data transcriptomic data or metabolomic data for example where you will find maximal variation in the data uh, However, in orthogonal partial least squares is a supervised method where you want to find the separation between, for example, two groups in discriminant analysis case, or you want to find correlation to, between your X and Y uh, matrix data. So basically what you want to do is to find the information in X that is related to the non-information in Y. And Y can be discriminant vector uh, or continuous variables. So this is just to show you the, the geometric interpretation of orthogonal partial least squares discriminant analysis in this case. And that is that OPLSDA tries to find finds the variation in X that is correlated to the Y variable. And this is done by a rotation towards the direction of Y, basically. At the same time, uh, that is really uh, nice with orthogonal partial least squares compared to partial least squares is that it finds components that are uncorrelated to Y but systematic in X. If you think about our data that I will be talking to you about here, they are all based on human data, so human individual data. And of course, of course, um, human beings are complex and not all the variation that we are looking at will be correlated to our Y uh, vectors of interest, but rather there will be some kind of uncorrelated but systematic variation in X that maybe has to do with something totally different that we haven't been thinking about. Uh, as I told you before, in principal component analysis and in every multivariate data analysis, it is really important to think about scaling, to think about uh, mean centering, to think about pre-processing of data, filtering, and so on. Uh, so now I will start by giving you some results so that you can see how these different methods can be applied. And I will start with the aortic aneurysm. And as I told you before, we started by using 2D Deitch uh, data. And you see the gel there. You see that we have uh, separated the proteins according to their isoelectric point using isoelectric focusing. Uh, and thereafter, they were separa separated based on the molecular weight. And I have color coded the spots that are. Uh, that have been shown to be 
statistically significant in this analysis that I will talk to you about. Uh, just as that so that you can see that they were spread all over the gel and it was not only one single protein that we could find that was like a typical signature of this disease but there were rather a group of different proteins uh, that were found. We also use LCMS MS shotgun proteomics and for the transcriptomics data as I told you we used the Fimetrix exon array platform and there we could find gene expression and exon level expression. So looking at different, pro you're looking now at protein expression data, we had, 20 in order to find out uh, the differences between those uh, individuals having tricuspid, tricuspid aortic valve and those individuals having bicuspid aortic valve, I decided to uh, split the analysis in two parts. So the first part is those that have tricuspid aortic valve, and they are dilated and non-dilated. And the second part would be those that have uh, two cusps, so bicuspid aortic valve for dilated and non-dilated. So in the first part for the tricuspid aortic valve patients, we have 21 patients and we have 302 protein spots. Uh, and the model, I'm writing here that the model is good. Uh, looking at um, uh, R-square and Q-square values that I'm not showing here, but uh, you can look into those in, um, in the publication if you want. So basically the goodness of fit of the model R-square is good and the predictive power of the model based on cross-validation is Q-square is also very good. So uh, in this case we can see if you look at the left the PCA score plot, three-dimensional PCA score plot, looking at PC1, PC2, and PC3, we can see separation between those that are non-dilated, which, which would be the black dots, and those that are dilated, that would be the red dots. Uh, performing supervised orthogonal partial least squares discriminant analysis to these data sets, uh, basically saying that while I have now dilated and non-dilated patients here, uh, can I separate those? The answer is yes, because you can see the separation in the score plot, um, uh, the right figure where you have TP1 that says that's the uh, predictive uh, score uh, first component and T01 that is the orthogonal first component. So from this now we can find out that those uh, tricuspid patients that we have can be separated based on dilated and non-dilated aortas. And then we could ask ourselves the questions, well, can we do that for bicuspid aortic valve patients as well? And the question, uh, and, and the answer is of course yes there as well, they could be separated based on dilatation or not. And now one would like to find out, well, now we know that we can separate those patients that are non-dilated from those patients that are dilated, both in bicuspid and tricuspid aortic valves. What is driving that separation? So basically, what proteins are uh, statistically significant in the separation between dilatation and non-dilatation? And in order to do this, what one can do is to use the um, cross-validation in multivariate data analysis. Uh, in this case, sevenfold cross-validation was used and uh, confidence intervals were extracted from each model and they were also uh, different first uh, loading components were, predictive loading components were also extracted and thereby we could see what proteins that were statistically significant for each model and also make a Venn diagram looking at what proteins that are typical for tricuspid aortic valve, typical for bicuspid aortic valve and which proteins that are shared. Uh, what is really nice to look at here is also to make a plot where you plot basically a tricuspid aortic valve model towards bicuspid aortic valve model 
and see which proteins that are uh, upregulated uh, common between tricuspid aortic valve, downregulated common, which are typical for TAV and typical for BAV. Uh, and you can see it in the right uh, uh, corner in, in this uh, plot. So doing all these things now, um, we could ask the question, can we validate the results that we got here? Because what we basically now can see is that we have 92 proteins that are um, shared between TAV and BAV models. However, 69 and 38 are typical for TAV and BAV respectively. So the question was now, can we validate these results? And for that we use LCMS MS validation uh, of 21 TAV and BAV patients. And basically the, the answer is, as you can see here, that we get similar results. We could separate uh, tricuspid and bicuspid, uh, dilated and non-dilated uh, patients in both tricuspid and bicuspid uh, aortic valve. And we could see that 57% were replicated in tricuspid aortic valve analysis, 71% were replicated in bicuspid aortic valve. And we could also understand that there are different protein expression fingerprints in tricuspid aortic valve analysis and bicuspid aortic valve analysis. Uh, and basically that was the hypothesis from the beginning that is there a, di is there a difference between these, is there a different mechanism towards dilatation between uh, patients that have uh, bicuspid aortic valve and those that have tricuspid aortic valve? And the, and the answer is basically yes. And now we can see <clears throat> the functional conclusions from this study. So what does this mean in, in a biological context? We could see that diverging protein expression fingerprints between dilated and non-dilated tissues in TAV and BAV, as I told you, and the dilatation in TAV is basically in, driven by inflammatory processes, while dilatation in BAV is a consequence of impaired repair capacity. So, then we wanted to ask ourselves, could we see a similar pattern in gene expression uh, among these proteins that were identified? And the, the answer is basically yes. We could see similar patterns that both in TAB and BAB we could find genes that were differentially expressed and that were common for TAB and common for between TAB and BAB and also uh, typical for TAV and BAV. And the same was applied to alternative splicing uh, analysis. And alternative splicing was actually shown to be a very, really important factor uh, in the diverging mechanisms of these two different etiologies of uh, uh, dilatation in aorta in another uh, study that has been recently published. So, uh, now I would like to tell you, so this was basically an example of orthogonal partial least squares discriminant analysis. Uh, and now I'd like to tell you about a really interesting study uh, that we performed on diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And in this case, we were actually, this would be a more of an integrative omics study where we were looking at uh, lipidomic data in X matrix and um, clinical data as a Y matrix rather than only one discriminant vector. So in this study we had 255 lipid species belonging to 12 different lipid classes. And for diabetes to start with we had 16 clinical parameters as I told you earlier and 448 individuals were included here. So 155 had diabetes and 293 were controls. But remember that in this case, the analysis was not performed as discriminant analysis, but rather uh, as integrative omics analysis using those 16 clin clinical parameters as continuous variables in uh, Y matrix. So this analysis then resulted in seven predictive components and one orthogonal component. 
If we remember the previous analysis on aortic aneurysm disease, there you could only get one predictive component because we only had one y vector and that vector was the discriminant vector. In this case we have 16 y vectors and they resulted in seven predictive components and one orthogonal component. Uh, we did the same kind of analysis for patients with myocardial infarction. Uh, of course, still 255 lipid species belonging to 12 lipid, cl lipid classes. In this case, we included 27 clinical parameters and 383 individuals. So we had 90 controls and 283 myocardial infarction patients. And this analysis then resulted in six predictive components. So, what we now wanted to find out is basically what different lipid, uh, lipid species were driving these models. So basically we could see that the models were good, we could see that there was correlation between our X, so meaning 255 lipid species, towards those clinical parameters. And when plotting them uh, in the score space, we could see that there was a certain drift towards differences between those having myocardial infarction that are red and those who did not have it. Uh, and now we wanted to find out what lipid species that were driving this. Uh, correlation that we could see. And we could see that 17 lipid species were unique for uh, diabetes, mainly glycerophospholipids, and 19 lipid species were unique for myocardial infarction, mainly sphingolipids. 123 of those were common. And now I'm talking only about significant lipids. And in order to find what significant lipids we have in this case, we cannot only look at uh, the predictive components and the uh, um, confidence intervals from cross-validation because now we have seven or six predictive components and it makes it really hard to interpret. What we, however, can do is to look some, at something that's called variable importance, VIP. A value that would summarize the predictive components for each model and thereby we could find out what uh, lipid species that were, what loadings and in this case lipid species that were significant for the correlation seen between uh, our uh, lipid species matrix and our clinical parameters. So, in summary, uh, I hoped that I, my hope for this presentation was to give you a flavor for how multivariate data analysis can be applied to different omics data sets in different diseases, and in this case, aortic aneurysm and myocardial infarction and diabetes. So, Aortic aneurysm, we could see that dilated and non-dilated aorta tissue separate well in both tricuspid and aortic valve at both protein, gene and exon levels. Dilated and non-dilated aorta show different protein expression patterns in dilated and non-dilated tissues with respect to tab and valve. We could also validate successfully the data using LCMS MS and also conclude that analysis at all levels suggests different mechanisms of dilatation between tau and bar. Also in myocardial infarction diabetes we could understand that PC and tag molecular lipid species signatures were found in diabetes patients while tag mole molecular lipid species based signature was found in MI patients. And basically I wanted to, to show you how multivariate data analysis really could help us identify important biological aspects of these three different diseases uh, using omics data and uh, orthogonal partial least squares together with PCA. So I would like to thank some people who 
who were Per Eriksson, who is the PI of the Arctic and Eris study, and Ulle Melander and Celine Fernandez, who would be the PIs for the diabetes and cardiovascular disease study. And my colleagues at SciLife Lab in, uh, in our team, and all the members of the two groups, as well as people who we were working together with the proteomic part of the analysis, Jan Lechti and Ruima Medebranca. Anders Franco Seleseda is the surgeon who was uh, giving us the samples basically for the aortic aneurysm study. And Florence is our collaborator in France, and Ulf Hellman helped us identify the protein spots with using Malditoff. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Sandra. I'm stunned. Fantastic presentation. There are a couple of questions already typed in the question toolbox, and we will very shortly be back and try to respond to them. So for the moment, to all the watchers and listeners, and to you, Sandra, thank you for your, for your time.